slash and cast. All right, folks, welcome to the Monsters Madness and Magic Podcast. I'm your host, Justin, here with a quick word before we dive in. In this episode, I chat with creature actor and special effects legend Tom Woodruff Jr. about Terminator, monster movies, becoming a demon in Pumpkinhead, Fred Ward, Stan Winston, and more. And if you're out there listening and you feel so inclined, please leave us a review. Helps us show up on searches and all that good stuff. Anyway, without further ado, here you go. It'll pass it, Harley. Let it finish. No, you gotta stop it. It's what you wanted. No, not like this. Not like this. I see it. This is wrong. Nothing I can do. It's gotta run its course now. What did you think? It'd be easy. Neat and clean and painless. You're a fool. If you won't help me, if you don't help me, then I'll do it myself. I'll do it. I'll do it myself. You'll fail it, Harley. You'll fail and you'll die, too. Then I'll die. Then I'll die. And pay the final price. All the sooner. God damn you, God damn you. He already has some. He already has. Greetings, boils and ghouls. This is your comrade, the Crypt Keeper here, reporting dead from the sanctuary of the strange. Tonight's macabre myth is a fright-filled feature One overflowing with monsters, madness, and magic. (laughs) All right, so Tom, don't do anything fancy here. Just to get started, why don't you take us back in time to when you were a youngster? Were you a book reader, fort builder, troublemaker, or all of the above? Wow, that's really cool. I, uh, I'm pretty sure on all of them except Troublemaker. Depending on how old I was, when I was in, uh, until I was in high school, I wasn't really connecting with a lot of people. I had, uh, uh, you know, three or four very close friends, and they became my friends because I was making my own Super 8 movies. And you know, with them, with them, we would get, I would get into shenanigans. Shenanigans. We like to call it shenanigans <laughs> because it didn't involve police. You know, goofing around. We were always being clowns. We would drop in on. Uh, teachers homes that we knew and just hang out with them for a while and talk and we'd screw around and back then we had uh, you know the wonders of the cb radio oh, yeah. where you could pretty much get on your dad's cb radio and be anonymous and just start getting things going with other people and getting <laughs> riled and then trying to calm them down and then make stupid jokes anyway that was my troublemaking fort building um i did okay with that and obviously the moved into the monster stuff really early in life so what do you think it was about monsters specifically that sort of spoke to you on like a creative level yeah good question i i i was so young i i remember the the first time i ever saw a, a you know real monster movie it was was the, the original frankenstein with, with boris karloff and uh I think I must have been like, I don't know, five or six years old and, and caught part of it on, on television. And I just completely fell in love. And I don't know if it was because I like the scariness of, yeah. of the look of the Frankenstein monster and, and, and a lot of monsters in, in on, on TV and in movies, obviously, because I, I do that. But there was something about seeing Karloff. And to me, the, the, the creepiest thing about it all was not that he was a monster and not that he had a flat head and bolts at his neck, but that he was a dead man, you know, he was, a, he was, I know, I know, right? Frankenstein said, he's never lived before I created this body, but but for all intents and purposes for me, it was a dead human being up and walking around. And that was, that was the most chilling part for me. And if I get into the right mood when I'm watching the first two Universal Frankenstein franchise pictures, I can pick that mood up again if I'm lucky. So how early on did you start to experiment with your own makeups and sort of tinker around as a kid? <laughs> Well, one I think one of my early uh, my early failures was uh, I wanted to make a blood capsule 
so that my brother and I could pretend we were in a fight when the babysitter was there. And, you know, he would pretend to punch me. I'd bite down in this blood capsule. I couldn't find any capsules. I couldn't find anything that would seem to work that I could close or, you know, put a little few drops of blood and close it all around. For some reason, I used a piece of paper. And you can pretty much guess how it goes. But timing was critical because my mom and dad were heading out the door and the babysitter was coming in. I had to make this work. So I was, and, and I was using, I was using food dye. I wasn't even using, you know, the smart way of getting some kind of stage blood or making it clean. So I just remember I had red streaks on my face for a while. I think that I left a red stain on the kitchen floor as well. So yeah, my parents were pretty forgiving. So is it safe to assume that at some point in your childhood, that famous Monsters of Filmland comes into the picture? Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. It was uh, this early to mid '60s, the, the birth of the Monster Kids, right? right. Um, I think that's what Bob Burns uh, coined the term Monster Kids because we all grew up, we were all in the same generation, and that's when monsters were hitting TV and toys and records and all that stuff. And I had a, a an Aurora Monster model kit, and I don't remember which one it was, but it came with a certificate. You could send away for Famous Monsters magazine, Famous Monsters of Filmland magazine. So I think it was a quarter or 50 cents. And I taped some money to an index card. I sent it in. And, and when I got it back, I remember the issue is, uh, I think it's issue 33. It has this beautiful painting by Ron Cobb of uh, Lon Chaney as the Hunchback. And I read that thing to pieces, front to back, over and over. And I think I... Uh, I think I eventually replaced it, you know, later with a back issue, but <laughs> it, it, I destroyed it. And um, and I never could find it in the local newsstands. And it wasn't until a couple of years later, I think it was, uh, it was when Planet of the Apes was coming out. And it was some, some issue with Jonathan Frid from Dark Shadows. I remember all this stuff. The useful stuff I can't remember, but <laughs> I can remember. That was like gold, walking into a newsstand and, and seeing famous monsters of film. And my friend was with me, and we just, you know, started buying them there. And it was just a great time in my life. At what point does your interest in the arts arise, sort of? When do you want to try theater? And were your parents involved in that decision at all? Did they push you that way? No, I think, funny, I, I, this is weird, but, but when I look back in, in kindergarten, you know, when you're drawing stuff at a kindergarten level, and I, I don't know, I was drawing trucks or something, and the teacher said, oh, let's make a city. And she loved my drawings, which I glommed onto that feeling, you know, I, I wanting to get somebody to like what I did, and that meant they would like me. She rolled out this big sheet of paper on the bulletin board, and she gave me the job of telling all the other kids what to do. And it's funny, it's like, uh, I didn't realize it. It's funny, it was like having a taste of supervising a crew, you know, yeah. in kindergarten. And I just remember drawing little pictures of trucks and handing them out. People would, you know, stick them to this big thing with paper. That was fun. That was also kind of a, a, a character building thing for me to know that, that I could, because of, of what I could do with art, I could get other people to join on and make something cool out of it. But then from then, it was pretty much a jump till uh, ooh, nine or 10, I think, before I really started studying, getting my hands on books, you know, and magazines on how to do things and how to how to sculpt and how to make molds and, and masks. And I made some early masks then. I got into high school and instead of having to do some kind of a written report, you know, like for a, an end of the semester project, I would I would make these short little super eight millimeter films. It always worked in regards to the teacher considering that as art, you know, whether the movie itself was good or bad, didn't matter. But I love that feeling. I love the feeling of knowing that I just want to make monster movies. I never thought about moving to Hollywood or how I would have to do it. I just knew that that's what I wanted to do. Eventually, when you do make that move, how does your first professional opportunity happen for you? It took me a number of tries. When I graduated from high school, as a gift, my parents gave me a, a ticket, you know, round trip ticket to fly out to Los Angeles for a week. And my sister, went, my oldest sister went with me just so we wouldn't, you know, wouldn't be just all on my own. We wrapped that up. I had a couple people, oh, a couple people I'd started writing to earlier, you know, like I got a hold of John Chambers' address and I wrote to him and he said, oh, you have to visit me sometime when you're out here. So, but some things happened. We didn't, I didn't get to see him on that trip. So I returned home and then two years later, a friend and I went to, um, drove car cross country to California and we got part-time jobs at uh, Six Flags, you know, Magic Mountain. And that's when I really started to meet people. You know, I met John Chambers and he sent me around to meet, you know, Tom Berman and Stan Winston, and Ken Chase and all these other great makeup artists. They were you know, well, well uh, achievement, you know, type makeup artists. And that was really cool, you know, meeting all these guys. Oh, he sent me to NBC and he sent me to CBS and I saw all these guys, you know, and when I look back and now it was just, it was just a perfect time where 
these guys were still working that had impressed me you know, and, 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 and as a kid had given me an inclination to go that way. So that was great. And after the, the summer, came back and uh, finished college. And then I went out. By then, a uh, year after that, I got married. My wife went out. She was able to find a job pretty quickly uh, in the accounting field and get a steady job. And that gave me the ability to, I was also working full time, but I could take one day off a week and I would just keep making the rounds of the different studios in town. And, and uh, I think all in all, from the time we landed in Los Angeles, uh, oh no, sorry, we drove. But that, by the time I got into Los Angeles, I think it took like six months before I finally got my first uh, job with Makeup Effects Labs. And what, what was the first assignment? I'm sorry, I can't hear you. It was Metal Storm. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. No, God bless him. Charlie Band, he would just put out movie after movie after movie. <laughs> and uh, he was doing well and, and uh, you know, got a lot of people, a lot of work. It got me my first job with Makeup Effects Labs. So I'm just kind of I'm just kind of kidding. You know, they were, right, right. Had Charles on here a few weeks back. You know, he's he's helped a lot of people to get their start. You know? Yeah, he has. Hasn't he? It's kind of cool. I mean, a lot of people talk about Roger Corman and getting Gail Hurd started and Jim Camather. But but I think Charlie Band probably has uh, has left a wider trail, you know, in people's minds for getting into the movies. Right. You know, I said the same thing to a guest a few weeks ago, and he did not have the same opinion. No. <laughs> he, he did not like the fact that I mentioned Charles Band with Roger Corman. It was, the fans of the, get us both on together. Yeah, yeah, right. Fans of the show will know that that was Lloyd Kaufman. Uh, <laughs> Wait, Lloyd Kaufman. No. Okay, Tom. So terminator of course at at the time we have no idea that this is terminator this is james cameron when did you realize after the fact that you worked on something special you know honestly when i when i first read the script and i hadn't read a lot of scripts up till then i mean when i was in college I i was able to find you know reprints of scripts somewhere i was able to so i understood how to write a script i understood how to read a script i had just started at stan winston's it's funny because a couple of guys that i worked with at makeup effects labs went to Stan, Stan Winston when they were out of work. And Stan said, oh, I need somebody else. Do you know anybody? And both of these guys told Stan to call me and Stan brought me in for this movie that was going to be called Terminator. And, and it's funny now, right, to be in that position of looking <laughs> back. And it's, it's like looking at Rick Baker and, and, and the guys that did the uh, cantina creatures for a uh, some, what did he call it, some dumb space movie. <laughs> um, you never you never know. Nope. But it was so cool. So I took the script home one weekend. And I was just fascinated. It was just so clear to see everything that was written was so clear to see. And I love the story. And that was, you know, I, I, I keep telling people a lot of uh, finding success in this business is being in the right place at the right time and also having the talent to back it up. And I was, you know, at a few times, a few times I've had that happen. And this was certainly one of the first times. And, and man, it was uh, uh, made a really big, a big impression on me of how much satisfaction i could get out of working with people and building monsters and taking them to set making them work right you just mentioned the talent aspect is there something that you look at as as a monster maker that you felt you needed to improve on and that you worked on early on something that you felt was sort of weak oh absolutely i think my uh, my drawing and it still is i still think of my drawing as being very weak because as i started to get more and more comfortable with with doing sketches you know with other people around and watching him and i remember sitting with stan in his design room and we were working on drawings for the monster squad and stan was sketching a a gill man and he said come over i'll, I'll, I'll show you what i've learned and he was showing me all the you know these a handful of techniques and i've sort of uh, I sort of used an abridged version of that, but uh, you know, what happens is we, Alec Gillis and I started this shop, and and it was it was just devoted to wanting to build the best and the most realistic monsters and doing things that hadn't been done before. We tried some different things for makeups, the animatronic characters, and all of that stuff, and it really was it was just great for term to, to jump from Terminator into a couple more shows with Stan, and then breaking off on our own. You just mentioned the Monster Squad. That's an important movie in my childhood, you know, and I think we just passed the 35 year anniversary, 35 year anniversary a day or so ago. Yeah. Still some of the best looking creatures around. It, that was a, that was a great show. It was uh, when it was first brought to us and we met Fred Decker, you know, the writer and director. And, and, and we were all excited because the plan was to use the original Universal Studios monsters. Yeah. And so for about, for about I don't know, a week or so. We're back there at the shop going, oh, this is going to be so cool. I want to 
I want to, I want to do a Frank, I want to do Frankenstein. And, you know, this guy wants to do the, the Wolfman. This guy wants to do the creature. And it was a little bit of a, of a disappointment when, when Stan and, and Fred came back and said, no, they won't give us the, the, the rights to their creature. So in the end, they were all revised and all new anyway. So it's not, it wasn't like it, it killed the project for us. We just had to kind of re-aim, you know, our, our uh, ambitions properly. The Gill Man was the first, your first opportunity in suit, correct? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, how did that finally feel for you, being a monster fan, to play a monster? <laughs> it was great because uh, <laughs> because there haven't been a lot of uh, Universal Gill Men. Right. <laughs> Rico Browning and uh, Ben Chapman, and then I think in the last one, Don. No, I can't remember the guy's name. So there, I'm the fourth creature from the Black Lagoon ever. <laughs> Uh, instead of like a dozen Frankenstein's or forty werewolves, you know, it was like. But but that came about because I was so excited to do. It. I never thought I would be able to uh, to go out and and actually perform creature stuff. But I used to do it all the time when I was a kid, you know, make movies. But at the time, uh, I wanted to build my own gorilla suit off the clock at Stan's shop. So I had the guys there do a life cast of me, and we had finished the life cast. And when I went to Stan and I said, you know, is it possible? Could I? Could I play the creature? Uh, and, and then I figured, here's the thing that's really going to make the difference. I said, Stan, I already have a body cast. <laughs> <laughs> and I have Cherie's thinking, having a body cast is the least of my concerns right now. He was very nice. He said, okay, sure. Let me uh, let me see what they, they say at production. And they gave me the thumbs up. And that's what started it all. So do you think your background in makeup and effects gives you a sort of inside baseball, inside track, heads up on performers that may not have worked in that area that are trying to perform in the suits? Yes, I think so. And and uh, in, in part because I was doing everything I could to make it easy on set for Fred Decker, you know, for the director, right. to be able to do my job. So he didn't have to worry about giving me tips, you know, try this and try that. Just direct it like you would a normal director. And and also from the point of view, I'm, I'm a very shy person. I've gotten all over a lot of that. But then I was so very shy and I thought, a creature's great. Cover my body or cover my head. Nobody can see me. I can do whatever I want. I don't even have to do any lines. So that aspect of, of being able to do that, that creature character was helped because when we would build the suit, we would build things that look really cool that, but aren't necessarily comfortable. And, and I was up for anything. You know, I would, I would have that head and hands and feet glued on and they would stay on all day. And I think my longest day was 16 hours, which included a few hours at lunch and a few hours towards the end of the day where I just laid on the, the couch in my dressing room because <laughs> I didn't want to remove the hands and the feet and, and take a chance on tearing things or, or messing them up. So I was I was dedicated to making it look bad, <laughs> dedicated to making it look good, no matter how bad it made me feel. Right. Uh, but yeah, that was uh, that was pretty special. Andre Gower was on not long ago, and he was mentioning that Tom Noonan would just uh, wear his Frankenstein suit on the way home, and he actually got pulled over by the police one day. Uh, that's good. Yeah, it did. It got to the point where, you know, we'd be making him up at four o'clock in the morning and they'd, they'd shoot till midnight and he'd have to get up at four o'clock the next day. And instead of having to drive back home, he would just, I'm sorry, instead of having to drive and find a place to stay, he would just have, uh, he would just drive himself home in his makeup. And, and uh, he did it a couple of times and the makeup survived, you know, just lying in bed and sleeping for a couple of hours. So that saved some time on the other end as well. But that's really... Uh, I know from working nights and working long extended night hours, not wearing makeup, just working as a puppeteer, it becomes a real grind. So yeah, hats off to, to Tom Noonan for, for making the most uncomfortable thing work. <laughs> right along with the Monster Squad and importance from my childhood, but a little less kid friendly is Pumpkinhead. I'm just wondering when you're in a suit like that, specifically for pump, Pumpkinhead, I guess, are you trying to focused on trying to per portray yourself as this demon or are you just trying not to trip and fall in the suit? You're absolutely, it's, it's, it is trying to be a, the, the best demon I can be. Things happen and you know, there have been times I've tripped in a suit and uh, and everybody gets up and they run over and, and I'm, <laughs> I'm thinking, oh, I actually told my, uh, told the crew once uh, later in life, I said, look, if I'm in a suit and I fall over, if you see me start to get up, just let's just be cool. Let's not get everybody all excited on set and I'll get up and shake it off, whatever. If I'm not moving, certainly, then then come and see what's going on. We were shooting. We were shooting the Predator. One of our Predators was standing. We were inside the ship. And, uh, Alec and I and the guys were puppeteering things with the radio control. And, and I just saw this Predator do this. 
And then he just dropped to the floor. And I just gave my controller to one of the guys and I ran up right away to you know check on him and stuff. And he had just, you know, gotten whatever dizzy and stuff. <laughs> Came back. One of my guys gives me a hard time. He said, You said not to run up to people if they've fallen in the suit. <laughs> I said, But it's different if the guy may be not breathing. <laughs> I had to specify some of the details. Stan directed Pumpkinhead, right? Yeah, he did. Yeah. Yeah, so Obviously, you had worked with him many times before. How was it with him behind the director chair? Uh, it was great. Oh, my God. It was great Be because he knew creatures, but he also knew storytelling. And I, I think that's one thing that a lot of people know Stan Winston, and rightly so, because of all the amazing stuff he's done from early in his career, all through the Jurassic Park days and the Iron Man and Marvel, you know, all of that stuff. But but he is a uh, he's, he was a very good storyteller. He had a script that he'd let me read, and, and he said, "You know what? You want to do notes on this?" And I said, "Yeah, sure. That would be great. He's a very creative guy." But um, I liked his storytelling, and I think I think he would have done more directing. But um, they say in Hollywood, your second movie is more important than your first movie, mm. right? Because your first movie could just be a fluke. Because Pumpkinhead, it wasn't a huge, you know box office breaker but you know it obviously created a lot of fans even as a cult film but his second movie out as a director didn't quite come together well and and it really didn't find the fans that uh, that pumpkin had had so i think that i think the uh, the opportunity to be a director storyteller kind of disappeared then moving right along past pumpkin head we're in 89 now i'm just looking at your imd credits and looking at movies that pop out to me warlock Julian Sands, one of my favorite actors. What were you doing specifically on Warlock? That was an, an early thing Alec and I did after we broke off from Stan's shop. We just got a call, and, and they had already finished the film, and they weren't happy with the look of the final. The I, I can't remember the actress's name or the character in the movie, but they weren't happy with the final makeup look. So so Alec and I took a life cast, and we back and, we, and, and uh, got some notes from Steve Miner, from the director, and redid it, it, came back, and, and it was cool. You know, I think that might have been the first thing we worked on by ourselves without being involved with Stan and his team. And yeah, meeting meeting uh, Steve Steve Miner, right? Oh yeah, Steve. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, God, that was great. You know, he was he was kind of a, a favorite of mine when I was still watching early movies that he had done. Oh yeah, he's a TV and film giant. He's worked on pretty yeah. much anything you think of. Strangely enough, earlier today I spoke with Ludi Lin. He portrays Liu Kang in the new Mortal Kombat movie. Oh, okay. <laughs> and you were also Goro in the original Mortal Kombat movie. Yeah. So did he mention? Did they? Did somebody else build a hundred and twenty pound suit that would uh, kill the person? I don't. Inside? I don't think that happened on their film. <laughs> you know, again, you. you uh, <laughs> We're ambitious, you know. We're, you know, you're, it's a little bit of dreaming and planning and hoping, and uh, um, I think we we put a little too much into every one of those directions because, uh, well, first of all, production told us what they wanted. They wanted a completely untethered, four-armed Goro, you know, animatronic Goro that could walk around, have lip sync, and talk. And then they wanted a stunt version, and they wanted to be able to shoot him like a real actor, just have him stand up and do stuff. And, and then they told us how much money they had. And we said, Phew, okay, if something like that would have come up at this time in our careers, you know, I would have said, I, I would have said, you know, I can't, there's not enough time to do this. You know, we'd have to design, you know, we would turn it away. But back then, you know, we're young and we're enthusiastic and, and hungry. And we said, yes, we'll find a way to make it work. So we had a great team with us. You know, we had uh, guys like Dave Penkis and, and Evan Brainerd and, and um, God, I, I apologize, other guys that, that I haven't seen for so long, but it was a whole crew of people, uh, Dave Kinlan, designing and, and, and creating a way to make upper arms move. And we ended up doing it. We did have an umbilical cord, but have them move it at normal speed because of a, a puppeteer that was wearing like a, a, a armor suit, you know, a, a, an exoskeletal suit where he could move his arms and Gora would do the same exact same thing. And we had worked out a, a system to pre-record dialogue and we had actors voice recorded and, and it was really cool. I think people either love it or they hate it. I think, I think it's really pr pretty diverse, but <laughs> I loved it. I loved the experience. It was a hard. It was a hard show. Really difficult show to shoot. And you know, because I, I was looking at things through a, a TV monitor. I think we were pretty proud of that idea. I said, let's <laughs> put a monitor inside because I don't want to have to cut eye holes. And that worked fine. It took me a little while because I wasn't seeing through a camera. I was seeing what was shot. And the camera was over there facing my way. So it became the thing like, you know, when you're looking in a mirror and you, and, you, and you go to move your, you know, you go to move your right arm, but instead it's this arm that moves. So you have to kind of flop yes, it reverse. In your head. Yeah, flop it in your head. I, it was, <laughs> but I got, I got it down, you know, it was pretty cool. So that was you in the suit. It was the, yeah. the suit during the, uh, the Lyndon Ashby scene with the, uh, 
The crotch punch. <laughs> <laughs> I, I say, man, he could have uh, he could have pulled that punch a little bit. <laughs> yeah, pretty excited. <laughs> Tom, you're obviously you're not always playing a monster or a creature. A lot of times you're just playing an animal. So, is it more difficult from a performance perspective to create original movement for a monster or to emulate an animal? Hmm, is it easier? I I think I think animals, particularly gorillas, which I love. I've always loved gorillas, and I and I know all of all these guys in gorilla suits, and and that's what I wanted to become as well. And I've done that. But I think when you're doing something that everybody recognizes as a gorilla, it's a little trickier, you know, because we've all seen them at the zoo. You know, we've all seen you know things on TV and stuff, and we understand how a gorilla looks and moves, if if, if not in words, in our minds. You know, I think we know what it is. But but uh, because of that it's a little bit trickier to not kind of wander out of that um out of that uh, space where people are going to accept it as a real gorilla one of the biggest things is is you know standing up and walking on two legs which would completely destroy the illusion or so i thought until i saw i think it's still up on youtube there's a couple of videos of a uh, of a gorilla in a in a zoo enclosure a natural habitat and they're they're filming one gorilla on all fours, and suddenly in the background you see full grown gorilla just walking along on two legs, and it is the creepiest thing because partly because they're not focused on this, and look at the miracle of this gorilla. They're talking about this gorilla's plant based diet or something, and there's some big creepy two legged gorilla walking past. <laughs> um, I've seen that a couple times, you know. So who, who knows? Maybe there can become a point where I mean that's what gorilla guys used to do in the 30s and 40s, you know, for the most part, running around on just two legs and um, only a handful of them would go as far as doing arm extension and all this stuff to make them look more proportionately like a gorilla. So for this next one, I kind of have to break it up for you since you do so many things. From a character slash creature performance perspective, what's the most challenging one or that you've worked on and from a makeup special effects standpoint? Goro, because of the physicality of him, I mean, literally it was 120 pounds. We put on my shoulders and be inside and um what i started doing was to make it look like it was symmetrical i would see what our puppeteer was doing with the upper arms right and i would just match that with my lower arms instead of having four arms like flying around like an octopus at least that way it would look like there's some kind of symmetry to his movement and that was a little hard because i i had to be ready whenever those arms would come up to to catch up with them and have that symmetry in the meantime i'm concentrating on walking i had to walk down stairs blind i had to walk up to a table blind paul anderson wanted to do this shot of my lower arm picking up a peach handing it up to the upper arm so the upper arm can squeeze it and we did it but you know there wasn't a lot of rehearsal we shot it a few times. I don't know if it's in the movie. I, I remember on set, obviously, but I don't know if it made it to the movie. But but things like that, where where they wanted precision, that was always the most difficult part of, of wearing a heavy suit. And from special effects side of things, what was something that was very difficult that you remember? Hmm. Let's see. Well, we did the uh, the Santa Claus movies for Disney and Tim Allen. Yeah, big deal. It's uh, you know fat makeup and and a white beard. And and there's more to it than that, obviously, because because when Tim Allen became Santa Claus, you still want to see Tim Allen, and he was great because he you know we did a life cast of him, designs that we sent over and production approved, and we went into sculptures the same basic steps. It was difficult because it was such a big, nice, smooth, round face. Because it was Santa Claus, we didn't want to put in these, you know, weird little wrinkles and age marks or any of that. We just wanted to keep them timeless and very appealing and, and, and kind and warm. And when you do things like that, at least especially back then, I think I think we have more latitude today when we're shooting digital and we can go into post production and tweak things and smooth things out and make edges disappear. But back then it was all done. We had to make every edge disappear. Barry Coper, who was brilliant at doing the application and the paint work, would, would go in with a tiny airbrush. And Tim, Tim would sit there and just, he, he took it because he wanted to do this so, so badly. I mean, he wanted to do it good, but so bad. Mm -hmm. So, and Barry's there with his little, you know, airbrush finishing it all off. It took, I think the first time we put it on, it was like four hours. Tim was great through it all, and 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 then uh, uh, the hair pieces would go on, and and you know we built this big fat suit that he could wear. It was made out of a, a silicone-like material that would jiggle, you know, when he runs on a on a uh, treadmill. I think his patience started to wear thin. He stayed, we we stayed with him for all three films, and on the second film, he was a little like. Uh, 
he'd been through it all, you know, so he knew what to expect. And he said, I think that was the film where he said he had talked to uh, Eddie Murphy because Eddie Murphy did all of those mm, walls yeah. or Baker makeups. And, and he said, Eddie Murphy said, it's, it's really hard. It really gets you. You just have to kind of focus. And, and whatever whatever support anybody gives him is good for us. Turn on the TV and, and basically, you know, it was making new pieces. It was always out of foam latex because we wanted to make it lightweight. And I didn't feel like silicone appliances were really that well developed. I certainly hadn't had any input on on making them any better or worse, whatever. But 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 we still chose foam. And then by the time when we got to the third movie, Tim was <laughs> Tim was saying things like, let's put on the makeup. I'll stand in front of a green screen. I'll do all my lines. <laughs> <I'll be done. laughs> and, and he says that. And we're listening to going, oh, you're serious. <laughs> so, he was a laugh. We did this thing. We had the, we built a, a, some animatronic reindeer. And uh, the one reindeer was fully articulated face and, and played back, you know, or no, we had lip movement and everything. They just put in noises. We also had fallen in love at that time with this Tenacious D album. And there was one, there was one cut where Jack Black is just going off on his partner. And he's just he's saying, you don't know anything about being creative. What have you ever created? You sit up there in your ivory tower, blah, blah, blah. And we thought that was funny. <laughs> so we had our mechanical designer, Dave Penicus. We said, how fast could you work the lips of the reindeer into saying this stuff? And he goes, well, it's pretty tricky. I said, just do it, just do it. So it took him about a half hour. And what we wanted to do was get video of this reindeer dressing down Santa Claus by saying, you're not creative. And you don't. So we had it all set up. We had to wait till the kids cleared the stage because, as you would expect in a tenacious D uh, cut, there's going to be some some cursing. So and all the kids were leaving, and I said, hey, Tim, before you, when the kids are gone, before you leave, come back over. Okay, he comes over, and he's kind of a little impatient. I don't think he had makeup on, so, so but he was he had just done stuff. And we said, okay, boys, let her rip. And Pennicus turned on the uh, the system. And the reindeer looks and it starts saying its first line. And then pretty soon the head just starts doing this. <laughs> and then the head is down and you could just hear the Jack Black tirade. And uh, when it's all done, Tim Allen, Tim just looks at us and goes, very funny. <laughs> and, walked, walked <laughs> and what Dave Penicus didn't tell us was he didn't have the neck battery charged up. So it failed and just <laughs> dropped the head towards them. So he couldn't see anything. Made, and none of it made any sense at all. So. <laughs> 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 oh, it's oh, funny now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, now. yeah. Back then, probably not so much, especially with an aggravated Tim. Was it the James Cameron connection that with Terminator that kind of helps you get on Aliens? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. It was well, it was certainly the Stan Winston connection uh, that led to that. And um, and again, that was another thing where we read the script. By then, everybody knew who Jim Cam James Cameron was, right? right. And this time around, it was it was about getting to redo, getting to redo those original things. Like I sculpted the alien egg, and um, I sculpted the headpiece, and and Cameron didn't want the the dome; he wanted to see those bony headpieces. So I took the dome away and sculpted those. Some other guys had sculpted pieces for the aliens themselves. They were much simpler than what uh, what Giger was trying to do on the original movie, which was to have a whole one piece suit. So we had just these kind of floating polyfoam pieces that were painted in, in contrast to this dark gray leotard, you know, kind of like those um, uh, uh, skeleton costume would be, you know, just white bones on black. Right. And that's what what what, uh, what what Cameron was going for, and, and and it certainly worked. Oh my God, we were in London. We were shooting at Pinewood Studios. Our shop was in a soundstage that had most recently been used by Ray Harryhausen, and. Oh, it's just a great and a great time in our lives to be able to do something like that. So when you first started, did you ever think that you would win an Academy Award for your special effects? <laughs> I know I never did. It, it was it came as a complete surprise. It was a great year because in that same year, both Alec and I were um, nominated for Alien 3, along with two of the other visual effects guys. Uh, on Death Becomes Her, Alec and I had to choose between the two of us. The other three places were being taken by... Uh, uh, the, the visual effects company, right, um, to do all that stuff. So we had to flip a coin. I, I got, the, I won the, the coin toss. Uh, ILM got in there first, starting to, to say their thanks up on stage, and and uh, and I was able to get in and thank Alec. But it's it's much tougher today. I know that I've actually heard some digital people say uh, special visual effects means digital effects. No, it really doesn't. You know, it's like it's like it's a, a visual effect is something 
that can't happen without something special being made. You know, uh, Roger Rabbit, everybody thinks, oh, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a digital cartoon rabbit. But everything that rabbit does was a rig that George Gibbs had to design, like when he's picking up plates and smashing, those were real plates. And George Gibbs had to design this armature that would come in, pick up a plate, turn it over, come over this way and throw it and smash it and everything. And, and I think people have lost track of that hands-on involvement of uh, you know doing any kind of a special effect and i think they incorrectly claim that it's, it should all be digital look at you know jurassic park stan winston you know without stan winston's practical dinosaurs i don't think the film would be as as satisfying it would certainly be memorable you know that was dig beautiful digital dinosaurs nothing like that had ever been done but i do think it's important to have um, have uh, practical effects as part of the visual effects. But, but yeah, to answer the question in a long way, it was it was completely unexpected, especially that early in our career. Right, and up to then you'd worked on some, well, now, in retrospect, they're powerhouse projects, but what do you think it was specifically about Death Becomes Her that got you that award? I uh, Well, I think, I hope it was because it was in a comedy movie, and when you're working with all of these A-level actors, it's a kind of movie that's 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 kind of departed from a, a, a traditional, you know, creepy special effects movie. So the effects that we did, like an animatronic Meryl Streep head that was turned around backwards on a torso dummy that had working hands and everything, right? So the hands could come up and coming up with a way to put a RC uh, Meryl Streep head hanging off somebody's shoulders and some other heads that would crash on the stairs. The the only tricky part of that, and, and Bob Zemeckis satisfied it by making it a fun thing and not a horrific thing. So. That's that was you know again it's like the the gorilla analogy people know how people move as well as gorillas you know they know how people move so we had to make sure that puppet moved and delivered a performance in in a believable way. And I did want to ask you, Tom, since you did work on it, if you have any memories of working with Fred Ward on Tremors since he just passed recently. Oh yeah, oh yeah, Fred was great. You know he came back for the the second, and uh, he and Kevin Bacon were were beautifully cast you know, to work side by side and, and each guy having his own point of view, but, but primarily thinking that they both just want to get the hell out of it. <laughs> he was, he was, he was always a very um, understated actor, uh, understated in performance. He was in, he, he did a great part in, uh, not big, but a great part in Escape from Alcatraz as one of the Morris brothers that helped Clint Eastwood's character escape, you know, just down. And, and I've seen him do a couple of other things. I think he was a real solid, he was more of a solid actor than a personality, if that mm, makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Have you seen any movies that have moved you recently? I was very proud, uh, selfishly moved me. I loved the, the way our work looked in, in Prey, you know, with the new, oh. Predator, their new redesign. I think what, what moved me about that was because I'm, all, I'm always very proud of the work that, that, that our shop, that, that ADI does. But um, in terms of that movie, Prey, and I don't know if you've seen it yet, but. I have, movie, it's great. Right, I'd like somebody's explanation that said uh, that says uh, prey is not a predator movie. Prey is a movie that has a predator in it, and and that's a great statement because it is just it's just so complete and so realistic and naturally told that by the time the predator gets there, he's not an alien that has just come from space to hunt. I mean, I know that's why he's there, but that's not what he is on screen anymore. He's he's as much of, of a believable interactive character as as any of the predator movies have ever been. That's one of my my recent favorites. Um, you know, before I know the movies are good because there are times when I actually <laughs> feel the hair on my arms and the back of my neck, and it's not because something's suspenseful. This is weird, but 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 just the uh, the emotion of something. I, I I can get that feeling of being involved, I, like somehow in, in some weird way inside, you know, inside my chest. Um, I, I think one of the first times that happened, and this is the weirdest thing to say. In, in line with the creature effects and monster movie background, but the um, the first Rocky movie was was for me was, that was probably one of the earliest movies that showed me how you can manipulate the audience without that being the wrong thing to do. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. It's like it's like it's like you're presenting a story. You want to present a story that's going to make the audience feel the ups and downs of that story. But and I, as I'm talking about, I swear to God, it's happening again. That that soundtrack, that that incredible uh, uh, Bill Conti soundtrack, especially during the last the last rounds that uh, Rocky was boxing, and his managers telling him to just lay down to give it up, and it's like, man, it's it, that is uh, that to me is great <laughs> is great movie making when it can cause a physical reaction inside, mm -hmm. and it wasn't and it had no monsters, so there you go. <laughs> 
that's a uh, that's powerful storytelling. Before you even mentioned it, I didn't I didn't realize that you guys had worked on Prey and my friends and I. You know, we're big monster movie guys. Obviously, we were just saying that's the best Predator design since the original. Oh no, kidding! Well, that's great to hear. Thank you. Is there anything on the horizon for you that you can tell us about without getting in trouble? We have two more films that are waiting to come out. One is called Smile, and it stars uh, Sochi uh, Bacon, Kevin Bacon's daughter, who was is fantastic in the movie. It, 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 I'm so glad to see. Uh, I'm so glad to see his next generation of his of his family, you know, coming up and doing these great things like Kevin Bacon and, and his wife Sarah has done. But um, the um, the thing about it is, it was a, it was a very small thing that we had to do. It was all I can say is there's a um, a small effect that makes a big thing happen in the story. So that one we have, I think that's coming out in October. And um, we also just finished a movie called Year Two, which is a uh, post post apocalyptic um, movie about werewolves that have taken over what what is left of the earth. So that's the, that will be it. And then um, for the next step, Alec and I are uh, we're we're shutting down ADI. We each want to kind of break off now and and do our own thing. It's it's get, it's kind of getting to that point in life where we've done so many things and and we've been kind of hitting this glass ceiling of wanting to be able to have a have, have more skin in the game. Um, it's been great making monsters for everybody. It's been great performing them for everybody. But um, I know from my point of view, with, with the years that I have left, uh, I, I still want to be able to direct. I directed a feature many years ago, and I just want to be able to do that again. There's something about, something that feels like the right next step from creating a monster character to actually creating a world through the storytelling of a movie, and and I'm 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 very hungry to do that next step. Um, I'm willing to kind of Alec and I are willing to part and and go our own ways now. Well, I'm definitely looking forward to that. Oh wait 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 wait! Do we have time? I have time. Do you have time? Yeah, I got this, time. <laughs> this is not good advice, but but it's very important. The second time I came out to uh, California and I met um, John Chambers, I had a friend of me, a friend of mine that lived uh, you know in Northern California. And he came down with me for the. The weekend, he wanted to meet. He was going to meet John Chambers with me, and and we had something set up to go over there, like on a Saturday afternoon, right after lunch or something. So earlier that day, my friend and I decide, you know what? Let's go to Universal Studios. We've got some time to kill. And what I didn't realize is back then, when you start going to Universal Studios, the first thing you do is you get on a a tram ride, and they take you down to the park. And you base you're basically at Universal Studios for four and a half to five hours. And I didn't know that. <laughs> so, of course, now we're late and we're kind of heading on over and knocking at the door. And, Ch and John Chambers opens the door and he stands with his hands on his hips. And I could tell that, that oh, my God, it was a bad, bad scene. He said, well, where, where were you? And I said, oh, I'm sorry. We were, um, what, you know, we ran up there to Universal Studios to see some stuff. And the show ran long. We couldn't get out. He goes, nah, I don't want to hear it. He said, if you have a meeting time set up, you better make it. If you have to pull off the side of the road and use an emergency phone, that or you have to do this, this when you make it, you're young, you make an agreement to meet somebody. So he really made sure that that I would never be late for anything for the rest of my life. That was I while he was saying that, I was always thinking, oh no, I'm never going to get into this business now because I've uh, I've completely alienated this guy. Yeah, God bless him. He was just trying to to lay down the law for something that, that, that showed that you respected a person enough to go and visit them at the time that you had set up. So uh, in the end, it was very, very important. Punctuality is key. That's great advice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Tom, it's been a pleasure talking to you. I'm going to get you out of here on time so you're not late for your whatever you got going on. And Yeah, I, no, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. It's been fun talking. I appreciate you, man. You have a great day. You too. Welcome to the night. You think you know Night Demon? Then the Night Demon Heavy Metal Podcast is for you. Step into the darkness as we peel back the curtain to give you an unprecedented, all-access look into the mind and the heart of the demon. We're talking band history, song analysis, studio anecdotes, stories from the road. It's everything a diehard Night Demon fan could want and more. This is the only place to learn the inside scoop, the deep dive trivia, the untold tales from the band members themselves and those closest to the Night Demon story. Need more? 
The sacred Night Demon Crypt will be pried open to reveal demo recordings that have never before seen the light of day. All with in-depth commentary by the band and the people who were there for the writing and recording process. This is a gold mine, a treasure trove of all things Night Demon. Head over to nightdemon.net or wherever you listen to podcasts. Listen to podcasts. Listen to podcasts.